Thank you, Lord Chairman. Uh, you've already touched on this, but if I can invite you to delve a bit deeper into how Putin's war, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, will change the way in which uh, European countries think about their security, in particular NATO states, what does it mean for the evolution of the UK's key defence alliances, including the US, France and Germany? I'm conscious that Professor Chalmers reminded us that Germany is now set to meet its NATO target of 2% of expenditure. And how does that affect the relative weighting of such European commitments versus those elsewhere? I, I'd like to just um, start on that one, that um, <coughs> European security has been fundamentally changed by the invasion of the 24th of February. And my headline on this, in a way, is that this is not a crisis that we have got to manage. Most of these things are crises we have to manage. This is not a crisis we have to manage. It has become a challenge in which we have to prevail. The Western world has to prevail in the outcome of what happens in Ukraine. It's, in a way, it's a more, uh, I'm very hawkish on this, it's, it's, a, it's a more aggressive way of saying what the Prime Minister says, that Putin must fail. Mm. And my version of that is yes, uh, the West must prevail. And one of the reasons I say that is because so much of the rest of the world is holding back to see what happens. China, of course, is partly protecting Russia and is uncommitted at the moment, is not as supportive as it might have been. India, the Indian leadership is holding back. Pakistan's leadership is holding back. Brazil's leadership is holding back. Throughout Africa, nobody is joining in sanctions. And what I hear from uh, f friends and, and diplomatic contacts across parts of Africa is that the view in African nations among the elites is that this is your war, not ours. Um, and as far as we're concerned, we don't really mind who wins. You know, we're faced with domination by autocrats or domination by hypocrites. We don't mind. Um, it, it doesn't really make a lot of difference as long as the grain flows. Um, and so, that, that in a sense, a lot of the world is not taking a moral position on this in the way that we think people should take a moral position on it in favour of the rules of international order. And so for that reason, I take the view that we have to prevail. The West has, has to prevail in the outcome of whatever happens in Ukraine, and, and it's made a big, big difference. Yeah. Second point is that, in a sense, NATO's deterrence has failed. Um, NATO is making it clear that it's performing its basic task in protecting its 30 members, and it's been very clear that one step over the boundary line of NATO will provoke a, if necessary, military response. That's fine. But the idea that NATO's presence was a stabilizing uh, factor in European stability and that if NATO, as were called out Russia enough in the build-up to this crisis, it would somehow deter it, obviously has, has failed and that's been a setback. And my third headline point on it is that President Putin has burned so many bridges behind him and when you look at what he says in his speeches, in his statements, what was written in the Novosti press agency 48 hours ago um, by this, what shall we do with Ukraine? I've never seen, the Novosti, RAI Novosti, uh, is a state-sponsored outlet. Nothing is written in Novosti without the Kremlin approval. And it was the nearest expression of, of genocide I've ever seen. And what it said was that, the de that A, the Nazification of Ukraine is throughout society. It's not just the leadership, they say, who are Nazis. The whole society is Nazi. And they said the denazification of Ukraine will have to be accompanied by the de-Ukrainianization of Ukraine. It was an astonishing op-ed, which can only have appeared with Kremlin approval. And I think, presumably, the Kremlin is flying a kite for these ideas to be circulated much more widely in Russia. And so the, the point I'm making is that President Putin has left himself very little room to go back. He will keep, I think, going forward unless or until he, he, he uh, falls, perhaps quite quickly, within Russia, or if, if he doesn't fall quickly, he will lead Russia to, to a state of real isolation in the next two or three years. Um, and the danger, and the thing that haunts me about this crisis, is I'm genuinely haunted by the prospect that this may turn out to be the first phase in a much more general European conflict. Not necessarily a war, but a militarized European conflict. 
because I, I find it hard to see from all the evidence I can absorb, as I'm, I'm not a Russian specialist, I don't read Russian, but I've been reading as much as I can in translation of everything that is coming out of the Kremlin. I cannot see the way back for this particular leader. And he, he's, you know, he's blaming now his military and his security services for failing to achieve what was an impossible aim, even plan A, to take over the state within 72 hours and finish it off with mopping up operations by the 8th of March was clearly impossible, clearly unrealistic, a major, major strategic blunder. And in the best Hitlerian tradition, I fear that President Putin will try to retrieve one major strategic blunder by making another one somewhere else. Because that throws everything up in the air and as the cars land, then the autocratic leader thinks they can deal themselves a better hand because they feel that they're more in control of the crisis than anyone else. And so for all of those reasons, I'm speaking very generally now, but for all of those reasons, I think that, that NATO is facing the greatest challenge by far since its establishment in 1949. And I, I, I hope that as this war in Ukraine, which I suspect will run for the rest of this year and become some sort of stalemate into the late summer and autumn, I hope that the consensus among the Western allies does not get diluted um, as this thing goes, goes on. And I fear it might, and I think the time for real leadership, certainly by the United States, which is it's, it's in the lead but it's not leading at the moment, it's in the front of us but it's not offering as, as much leadership as, as required. And I think there is a role here, a bigger role. For the, I think Britain's played a pretty honorable role in this crisis so far, other than on the refugees issue. But in other, other respects, I think Britain's done very well and we'll need to do better. And so we'll need, to, have to, we'll need to, be, to be better and lucky in the months to come. I'm sorry, that's all, that's all very general and apocalyptic, but honestly, I'm, I'm sharing with you um, an instinct and a set of analyses that I've been haunted by for the last month. Well, on this, I'm, uh, I'm afraid just as pessimistic uh, as Mike. I think this is a very dangerous uh, moment uh, for European security and our relations with Russia. There is no going back to where we were uh, before the invasion took place. Uh, and the fact that so many people uh, even uh, people, senior officials I talk to here, but certainly some of our allies, despite all the evidence, thought he can't possibly uh, do this, uh, has made us all think, I think, uh, re reflect on what exactly is motivating. This is in part about uh, uh, the Russia's attitude towards the NATO, but most of all, this war is about Russia's attitude towards Ukraine. Uh, the, the, the articles to which Mike referred very much about Ukraine, a denial of Ukrainian nationhood, we, uh, and indeed uh, this narrative that Ukraine has been Nazified, where in fact it's Russian that is becoming Nazified. So it's a, um, it is about Ukraine, uh, first of all. And second of all, I think we, we must, uh, and you know, if we are to be true to our principles, we must accept uh, Ukrainian agency. Ukraine is key. Ukraine has to make the really difficult trade-offs as we go forward in terms of if there is ever to be some sort of deal or ceasefire, which I think is a long way away, and what they want to achieve. Mm. And actually the prospects of Ukraine getting most of what it wants in terms of territory are a lot greater than they were even a couple of weeks ago. I mean, the, the route of Russian forces in the north is quite incredible. Uh, and there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's a, a, a debate among, out there amongst uh, military experts about the extent to which Russia really has large reserves that can call upon in the relevant future. It's, it's, it, there is a possibility Ukraine will be able to push back uh, all the Russian advances in February and maybe even more. But of course that will in many ways uh, uh, be uh, such a blow. I mean, it, it, if you read people from Moscow talking about the mood there, the mood in Moscow, the mood amongst the elite, amongst the Russian population is still there winning this. It's triumphalist. That last Putin is standing up for the country and so on. There is no sense of, of credible opposition within Russia. I mean, there are, of course, people who are opposing, but they're not politically relevant yet. Uh, so that is, a, that is an environment in which Russia can behave in ways which we really can't predict. So Alongside, uh, absolutely, I agree with Mike. Uh, it's very important to us for us to do anything we can to ensure Putin is seen to lose this. 
uh, it, it's also important that we do everything we can to avoid escalation to something much wider because uh, that would be very costly for, for all the countries of Europe. And there, you know, there's, there's, I think, a bigger risk of escalation to wider conflict uh, between the major powers than there has been since 1962. I think in the context of Butcher, Mariupol and the other things, the war crimes that we've been seeing coming out of Ukraine over, over these last few days, what you've just said to us is, for me anyway, one of the most important and chilling appraisals I've ever heard here in 40 years in front of any select committee, so thank you for that. Two weeks ago I was in the Baltic States and I met the uh, Lithuanian, a Lithuanian defence minister and they raised with me particularly the need to increase the size of our presence in Estonia, where we take the lead. And they said we needed to increase from a battalion to a brigade. And they asked about the possibility of an Israeli-style dome being provided over Lithuania and elsewhere to stop the kind of depredations that we have seen in Ukraine. We have Article 5 obligations to the Baltic states. Can you just give us a response on what you would have said to... Very, yeah, very, very clear. In, I mean, we have tripwire forces in the three Baltic states, which are reassurance, and they've done their job, and they do it pretty well. They could not begin to defend the Baltic states against a, an attack. The Baltic states could easily be cut off by land through the Savalki Corridor, and then they could only be supplied through the Baltic Sea itself, which would be a very dangerous process, very expensive and very dangerous. The fact is that unless we defend the Baltics early, they would have to be liberated quite late, and they certainly want to be defended more than they want to be liberated. And it may well be that as this crisis develops, because of the, the sheer ge geographical difficulty of defending the Baltics in the way one would defend Germany um, or any other, or even Romania or Bulgaria for that matter, um, it may be that there would be a demand, real defence forces rather than tripwire forces, into the Baltics, with the, of course with the full agreement of those states, but I'm certain that you would get it, um, and actually make good on the, the uh, requirement, the Article 5 guarantee to the Baltics. Because to be honest, if, the, if that Article 5 guarantee were now challenged, really challenged in the Baltics, there isn't much we could do about it with tripwire force. If the, if the wire was tripped, not much would follow without us having to fight back into the Baltics, we, the NATO powers, fight and liberate the Baltics, which, as I say, is exactly what they don't want. Let me just add very briefly, I think Sweden is very important in this regard, and part of the Swedish uh, offer to NATO has to be a more credible role in reinforcement, because however many forces you have there on a static, permanent basis, you will need to reinforce them rapidly in a crisis. And the other thing I would say is having a permanent American presence in the Baltic states will be very important, because that is the real American military power, is what the, uh, the Russia really fears. Thank you very much.